Coming to you from Crash Studios in Music City, USA, Nashville. This is the Rich Redman Show. On this episode, actor and comedian James Coker. And now, Rich Redman. What is up, rock and rollers? How you doing? Rich Redman here. Yep, it's that time. Another episode of the Rich Redman Show where we talk about all things music, motivation, and success. And I always tell Jim, Jim, who do we talk to? We talk to people like authors, musicians, producers, comedians. Yeah. <laughs> Today we got a really, he's a professional, funny man. He's a new friend. I feel like I see him every day because I follow his Instagram feed, but originally from Dallas, Texas, now living in Los Angeles. He's an actor, writer, and comedian. Check out some of these shows. He's been on 13 Reasons Why, 30 Rock, The Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt, which my girlfriend and I binged, Full Frontal with Samantha B. and you will not be able to escape this guy. He is on TV five times an hour for the new Spectrum campaign. Our new friend, James Coker. What's up, buddy? How are you? Thanks so much for having me, y'all. Yeah, man. So yeah, um, what's the weather trip. like today in LA? Is it sunny and 70 or what? Yeah, pretty much. It's really nice. I'm, I'm just happy to be back with my good buddy, Jim. We used to ride uh, out to Sturgis every year, you know, on our hogs. So uh, just getting to reconnect with him is a real treat. You know, see I kind of miss those days. Yeah, <laughs> you see what I mean? I mean, right <laughs> off the bat, right off the bat, we're into it. Jim's kind of a funny man. Um, what, what are your thoughts? Like right out of the gate, have you you heard of the Sebastian Maniscalco car, right? He's like one of the biggest yeah. comedians of all right now. Like he used to wait tables at at the, the Four Seasons on Doheny for like a decade, and really? now he sells out arenas. Wow, not yeah. bad. I mean, he's a very funny dude, and then he was uh, he was great in The Irishman too. I know, and I have yet to see it. I, Jim, have you watched The Irishman? It's a, a three-hour commitment. Movie. Yeah. yeah, it's a long movie. Yeah. And I've it, actually, I actually I would watch Endgame instead. <laughs> So Jim's a huge Marvel guy. I, I don't. Like, Mar- I don't know if you Marvin can tell from this. Marvin Scorsese would love that. <laughs> James, what are your what are your <clears throat> guilty pleasures? Do you have like things that you binge that are like like Jim has seen all twenty three Marvel movies twenty three times. Yeah. So, wow. I know. He, That's yeah. really impressive. I, I think uh, for me, I'm 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 a pretty basic white guy who loves Wes Anderson movies. So like uh, I've seen probably ever Wes Anderson film multiple times. That's now, my bag. Well, I like that. I could see that. Now, what was the movie with Adam Sandler? It was very Wes Anderson-like, very Magnolia-ish, but he was, he was a toilet salesman. Mr. Deeds. No, no. And then he had to collect these pudding tops um, to get points. Are you and then about he Punch felt, Drunk Love? Punch are about, Drunk are you talking about, Yeah. Love. Are you talking about the Paul Thomas Anderson movie? It's Paul Thomas Anderson. I always get Paul Thomas Anderson and Wes Anderson- confused well they got the same last name i get it it's i mean get it I, mean, that can happen. I know but i loved that movie it was so quirky and so offbeat but i feel like i could like watch it a million times you know it's one yeah. of those what's a movie watch you can watch a million same. times uh life aquatic with steve zissou okay there you go yeah. jim what about you it can't be marvel it can't be marvel can't be marvel oh man now you gotta you're making me think a gladiator's up there that's a good one and we just watched pulp fiction again that's a good movie. Oh, God. Never goes someone, stuff. someone who's really into Marvel, Jim, I'd love to hear what your thoughts are on The Boys. Have you seen uh, the we watched that? Oh, yeah. Um, interesting take and perfect timing for this particular time we're in in society. Yeah. It's very... Um, the anti-hero. Yeah. 100%. You know. Well, and, James, uh, you're yeah. from uh, Dallas, Texas. Now, I have a, an affinity for Dallas, Texas because... Why? I was, well, I wasn't born... <laughs> quite interesting. <laughs> Why in the world would you have an are you, You're born there, born and raised? I grew up there, yeah. I spent the first 17 years of my life there, but uh, I really haven't been back since. But what borough were you in? Was it like Farmer's Branch, Louisville, Garland? Where so were you? I grew up in um, Highland Park, which you're probably oh, fam- nice. familiar with. Yeah, um, which is very nice. It's but, very schmancy. Uh, it's very n- fancy. I, I had a weird upbringing where like, when I was born... My parents were really well off. And then when I was like six or seven, my dad lost everything. Um, and so... It's like Shit's Creek. Yeah. My my childhood was very much like Shit's Creek, but not as hilarious or quirky. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but my, my, my parents insisted we stay in Highland Park because the school's really good. So like yeah. I moved around 
um, I think I lived in like 11 different houses in the park cities as a kid. Cause like my parents would lease a house and then the you know, owners would sell and we'd move to another one. And as my, as, as I got older, we moved to like smaller and smaller houses, but my parents like held on to like all these things that they had when they were rich. So like they sort of became like hoarders. Um, but like, don't get me wrong. I'm, v- I'm very lucky and very privileged, but it was like a weird, it was w- a weird upbringing living in Highland Park, being around people who are so well off when like my parents were trying to pretend that they were still well off and convince everyone they were still rich, but they weren't. Yeah. Yeah. There's that movie, you know, The Purge and at the closing credits of The Purge, it's like uh, the most active area in the Dallas area tonight was the Highland Park area, you know, that I would believe it. Yeah. It's 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 a, if a, basically for the listener out there. It's a, basically a film where you can kill anybody that you want one day a year, and the government sanctions it. Yeah, it's like, like Mario Kondo, Holocaust. but for people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a pretty scary Orwellian concept. Now, so how did it all start for you? Because you're kind of like in the world of the dramatic arts. You do commercials, which are very uh, lucrative you know, for, for, for actors and can pay the bills while you're creating other things. And then you do these parts where you come in and you beat the heck out of kids on 13 reasons why, or you're kibitzing and sparring with Liz Lemon on 30 rock. And then you make all these kind of sketch pieces that you write and direct and star in. I mean, you're all over the place. How did it start? Uh, well, I, um, I started off in um in college i was a business major and i thought i was just gonna like you know go the corporate route and like work for a bank or something like that (laughs) and uh a few months before i graduated this thing came to school called campus movie fest where they give everybody a uh, like a, a camera and a laptop to edit on and you have a week to make a short and um I made a really dumb like five minute or six minute short about a guy who wakes up one day and he thinks he's like a hockey player from the 1970s. Um, and so like, you know, I'm like, I'm like rollerblading around campus in like a uh, old hockey Jersey and like a Jofa helmet. And I'm cross checking kids into bushes and <laughs> things like that. Yelling like slap shot and hip check. Um, Bumble. Yeah, it was a guy who thought he was he thought he was this guy named Tom Younghans who was a real hockey player. You can look him up. He played in the seventies and eighties in the NHL. Yeah. But I'm like, hey, my name's Tom Younghans and I am a professional athlete. Um, and people like people loved it. And, and you're like, in high school at the time. I was in college. Yeah. Oh, college. Yeah. Okay. And uh, I had you know people would drive by me on campus and yell like quote the the film at me oh great or quote the video at me and that was really fun and i was like oh this might be something i want to pursue and so i decided i wasn't going to use the degree that i spent four years getting and i wanted to work in film and tv and um i think because my parents were so financially responsible growing up i was very hesitant to do something creative um because of how um uncertain it could be um, yeah. And so I was like, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll work in that field, but I'll do something a little more safe. And so I was like, I want to work in production. So I told my parents I was going to work, move to New York. Uh, I had, I had a lot of friends from high school and college that already lived there. So it was like an easy transition. And I had a friend who worked as a production assistant on TV shows and movies. Nice. And he was like, you know, come live with me. And, um, cause he had an extra room in his house. And he was like, I'll, I'll, I'll try to like, you know, hook you up with the context that I have and get you a job. Um, and so I moved to New York and then nothing happened. (laughs) So what are you like, uh, 23 years old, 24 years old? I was 23. I was 23. And so I showed up and he's like, Oh yeah, I'm, it's really dry right now. I can't help you out. And then finally he got me like one job. He's like, all right, so I got you a job. My, My buddy said you can work this one day as a production assistant on a TV show called new Amsterdam. Ah, yeah. And it was a show. It's there is a sh- current show called New Amsterdam. It's like a medical drama. Not that show. It was a show with uh, the guy who played Jamie Lannister on Game of Thrones. Ah. And it was a guy who like traveled in time from back when New York City was a Dutch colony, and now he lives in current times and he's a detective. I don't know how the show worked, but I think it lasted a couple episodes. It got canceled. But I show up to work. And the guy that had agreed to hire me, like had a family emergency and wasn't there. So he's like, and so the person who was then in charge was like, I don't know who you are. Like, I'm sorry, you you know, I, I, I can't 
hire you today. And right. so he's like, you can hang out if you want. <laughs> and so I was like, and so it was a night shoot in Greenpoint, Brooklyn. We were like two blocks away from where they were actually shooting because we were with a uh, TCD officer, which is like a traffic control division officer that locks down the streets. And so I'm just like super upset because I've been waiting like two months to get into the biz. And then I show up and they're like, nope, sorry, but you can hang out. So we're like, it's like midnight and we're hanging out on the street corner with a traffic control officer. And these two guys ride by on bikes and they're like, Hey, what are you guys shooting? And you know, we chat them up. We're like, Oh, it's new Amsterdam. And they're like, Oh cool. We work on 30 rock. And I was like, Oh my God, that's like one of my favorite shows. Yeah. I would love to work on that show. Do you know if they're hiring production assistants? And they're like, I don't know, but we're all going to the bar. You want to come hang out with us? There you go. That's <laughs> even, that's even better. Yeah. And so it was, uh, it was two camera guys. It was a film loader named James Sylvia and a camera operator named Jonathan Beck. And they invited me to the bars, this bar called the pencil factory in Greenpoint, Brooklyn, which I don't think exists anymore. And, uh, I met all the production assistants on the show. I met uh, the assistant directors and they're like, yeah, here's my number. Like, you know, we're on hiatus, but call us back in like two or three weeks and we'll see if we can put you on when we need extra people. And they hired me for one day like two or three weeks later and I busted my ass and I, but, and I had a good attitude and everything. And so they brought me back the next day and then they brought me back the next day and it got to the point. Um, this was like season two of 30 rock. Early Whenever on, yeah. they needed extra people, they would bring me back. And then eventually season three, I got hired full time. So how did you end up weaseling your way in there as an actor? Was so, that years later or no? So I was working in production for a while. I thought I wanted to be an assistant director for a long time and eventually like a line producer and unit you know, production manager. Um, and I went and saw an improv show at UCB. I went to Herald Night, which is like all the house teams at UCB perform on Tuesday night. Okay, and so I, for our audience, tell sure. everybody a little bit with what the Upright Citizens Brigade is. So the Upright Citizens Brigade is a theater that's in New York and L.A. Um, the New York one, unfortunately, closed down recently, but the L.A. one is still open. I did not um, know that. Wow. Um, but it was you know, formed by um, the UCB4, which is Amy Poehler, Matt Besser, Ian Roberts, and Matt Walsh. Uh, they came from Chicago and formed this theater like in the late 90s, early 2000s. And then, you know, for a while it became sort of the gold standard in improv comedy, especially in New York City. Um, and so in order to be on a team there, you take classes and then you sort of go through the levels and then you audition to be on a team. So how many levels are there? Because I only did level one in the U and the LA UCP. <laughs> it was it's constantly changing. When I was there, yeah. you took like level one, one hundred one through four hundred one, and ah. then you had a to audition to get into the like advanced levels, which was like five hundred one and six hundred one. But I, yeah. I believe they've renamed how that works now. But um, it's like super competitive. But um, I I just fell in love with improv going to that show. And so I started taking classes there and at other theaters in New York, like the People's Improv Theater and Magnet Theater and performing there. And um, I just sort of fell in love with it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's, there's, a, there's an improv movie, Don't Think. Did you see it? Uh, don't Think Twice. Yeah. Oh. Uh, yeah. It's a great movie and it's like very accurate. So uh, me and a lot of friends have trouble watching it because it's just... Because it's, it's, it's so too, accurate. It's too real. <laughs> It's like right, right. watching the show Nashville and being yeah. from Nashville. People are like, yeah. yeah, is that Nashville show real? Is it really? I'm like, um, yes. Hey, I'm a big star. <laughs> Let's go down to Tootsies. <laughs> Let's go down to the, some of the big tonky honks on Broadway where tonky honks, honky tonks on Broadway where all the tourists go and just hang out there. Cause I'm yeah. a big star. That's what we I, do. I loved, my wife and I watched the first two seasons of Nashville religiously. We People really love the show, Jim. You know, we, you yeah. know. No, I understand they do, but it's, you know, hey, I'm going to go to the Ryman, and there just so happens to be a spotlight right on this thing where I'm going to be standing. Yeah. <laughs> my happenstance. So I sit there all the time. I mean, <laughs> why is improv so, such a foundation of comedic acting? Um, well, I think it, it goes back to what we've talked about because Rich and I, you and I met at Leslie Kahn's studio. We did, yeah. And, and Leslie talks about how she wants your acting to be like 100% technical and 100% organic. At the I same believe, time. At the same time. I believe improv perfectly hones the skills of organic acting because it is instinctual and reactive and requires you to um, actively listen 
to your scene partner as opposed to just waiting for your turn to say your line <laughs> and show off how great you <laughs> are in the moment. Right. Yeah. Um, and I, it, I think it forces you to, to, to learn how to have more of a symbiotic relationship when performing with other people. No, I love that. And, and, uh, Tell us before you finish your story, just so we can level the playing field with the audience. What is the Herald? It's a, it's a form of doing improv, right? It's, it's a form of doing improv. There, you know, there's a million different forms of improv, but this is probably the most popular or widely used form of improv. So you, you have an opening, uh, which is, a, you know, and there's a ton of different types of openings, but the opening exists for the sole purpose of coming up with ideas for the set. Heralds typically are like 25 minutes to 30 minutes. That's so a typically, long time. Long time um, to sustain, you know. One, one concept that hopefully threads. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, let's say like uh, the audience like throws out any suggestion that, you know, it's, you know, a cliche one would be like an item of food, like banana. And a very popular opening is pattern game so that everyone stands in a semicircle and they start just saying random words that uh, are connected. So you'll do what's called an A to C association. So you'll say banana and then, you know, you might say um, car crash, like that's your A to C association. And then you go from car crash and you A to C that to something else until you sort of find a game in that. And then someone might say, um, you know, car crash outside the Los Angeles zoo. I don't know, because there's a bunch of banana peels outside. I don't know. This is a bad example, bad pitch, but um, you'll generate these ideas for like a few minutes. And then those ideas are what you're supposed to introduce in your scenes throughout the course of the Herald. So um, you'll have three scenes, which are your first beats. And then you're supposed to call those. And then you have a group game, which is like separate of what you've scene which is supposed to be like a palate cleanser and then you're supposed to have second beats which are callbacks to the three initial scenes that you did wow and then you're supposed to have another group game which is like another palate cleanser and then at the very end you have third beats which you're supposed to tie together everything you've done in the previous 20 to 25 minutes okay so this is, uh, and that is long form improvisation. Yeah, it's this like watching thing, an episode of Seinfeld. You know how at Seinfeld there's like three different storylines and at the end they all seem to intersect? Yeah. Yeah, it's like that. Wow. So Jim wants to try this. Why don't we try some, some improv? Just, oh no, uh, I have not done us. improv in such a long time. <laughs> we, that's great because I haven't done it either. And, and my, cla <laughs> my class was two years ago. So, but uh, yeah. Okay, let's get ready for really bad stale improv. Three, two, one, go. I don't know how to do this. What are we doing? We need a suggestion. <clears throat> um, okay, squid. Right, suggestion. <laughs> squid? Yeah. Squid. Uh, blacktop. Oh, we're I'm doing the pattern game? I don't know, are we? <laughs> <laughs> we're not improvising very Jim, well. Jim, we should cut this short right now because I, I really want to hear this 30 Rock story. Now that, the, now that the playing field has been leveled, we, we know what a herald is. In true fashion, we're going to go back now to, to the 30 Rock story. Okay, great. Where were, you, where, where were you we? Went, you went drinking with the, with the camera oh, yeah, guys. Well, I, from went, I went drinking with the guys, and then I, I met the guys in, um, who worked, who were the production assistants and ADs on the show. And, you know, they just kept bringing me back. And then I eventually ended up working on the show full time. How I ended up being in the show is that the writers on the show knew that I was, uh, you know, taking improv classes and performing and making my own sketches online and stuff. So they knew, like, I was pursuing. Uh, this other path outside of being a production assistant. Nice. Um, and one of my friends who worked in the production office, his name's Nick Bernard, Bernard, uh, Nick Bernardone. He uh, is a staff writer on fear of the walking dead now. Oh, nice. He um, got to know the writers pretty well. And this one of the writers, Ron Weiner, who um, has written for Silicon Valley and a bunch of other shows so um, also makes, uh, you know, he makes uh, like songs in his spare time. And so he made a, he wrote a song called stop cutting to the guy, which was about um, you can find it on the internet, but it's about how when he watches porn, he doesn't like it when they cut to the guy. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> and <laughs> I so, want to see the guy. Yeah. And so, stop it, with the guy. It's like he, the song is like stop cutting to the guy. I'm not tracking oh. his story. <laughs> Um, and so he made, he made this music video for it. Um, and at, and Nick wanted to just ask somebody who he knew and was comfortable with to be in it. And so he asked me to be in it. And the other person who was in the video was Kay Cannon, who wrote all the pitch perfect movies Nice, and was, you know, wrote for 30 rock forever and was an executive producer on new girl and is directing the new Cinderella movie. And so Kay, uh, and Ron were in the writer's room and they had wrote, written this part in season five. And they're like, who should do it? And they were like, James Coger. And they're like, the PA? And they're like, yeah, he, he's really funny. We, we did a shoot with him and he was great. Um, just let him come up and read. And so I had to go up and do the table read um, and read the line. And uh, With I, Alec Baldwin and everyone. Yeah, yeah, with yeah. everyone. And I did an okay enough job that they didn't replace me with somebody else. No, and you look so young. And what are you, like 23 years old now or 24 years old? <laughs> I was like 25 or 26, I think. Yeah. 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 And is that where your parents are like, whoa, man, that's just all right, James. Like, are your parents like pretty proud of you with this? You're on this oh, journey. Yeah. It's pretty incredible. They were really excited, you know, um, but it was one of those things where it was so, um, it, it was just very rewarding and really fun to like get to do that for a day. Um, but then it was like, you know, the next day it was like back to work. I, I you know, I'm still a PA and I'm still like, you know, trying to bust my, bust my butt and yeah. Um, everybody talks about their first jobs in, in, in entertainment or Hollywood being a PA. What are yeah. those responsibilities? Is it like a giant 18 hour day of yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Or what? Well, I know the way I, th I believe New York and LA does it uh, in different ways. Uh, I think production assistants, I don't, I haven't done this in a while, but when I was doing it, production assistants have way more responsibilities in New York than they do in Los Angeles. A lot of the responsibilities that production assistants do are done by assistant directors in LA and they just hire more assistant directors. But um, essentially on a TV show in New York, you can get hired to be the first team PA, which is you're in charge of the actors. You're in charge of like getting them ready, getting them in the makeup chair, making sure they're dressed, making sure they have their sides, making sure they know the coverage, yeah. uh, making sure they're getting to set when they're ready to shoot. Um, and then getting them whatever they need. You can be the background PA, which is you're in charge of checking in all the extras and making sure that they have their props and they have their, their, the right wardrobe on and they have filled out all their paperwork properly. You can be, wow. you can be the uh, paperwork PA. So you're in charge of everyone's time cards and you're in charge of the production report, which essentially tracks everything that happens during the course of the day. Wow. Um, Sounds like fun. There's yeah. just so many people involved in making the movie magic, you know? Yeah. It's like my, my little thing that I did for the sci-fi channel for that show, Happy, we shot mm -hmm. right in Queens, New York. Wow. And, and it was like all of our trailers and the honeypots were lined up down this main thoroughfare in, in New York City. And like right. I, you know, the PA says, oh, this is your trailer. Here's your paperwork. Here's your costume. Then we're going to go over to makeup. It was like, it was a whole thing, man. It's so yeah. incredible. What an incredible experience. Yeah, but it was long hours. Like I, I know when I worked on Thirty Rock, and Thirty Rock had some of the better hours out of other TV shows in in New York. But like I'd show up and like, you know, I'd show up at like six thirty or seven, and then I'd brought, you know be there anywhere between eight and nine thirty at night. It was yeah. um, it was not long the, hours, not for the sure. faint of heart, but you're so learning was, uh, the ins and outs of everything. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Part time job. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, you, so you've lived in Dallas, New York, San Francisco, and Los Angeles. Uh, yeah, they're all so unique. Where are, what's your favorite? Uh, I mean, I love New York, but I think the version of New York that I'm in love with might not exist anymore. You know, not just because of the pandemic, just because like, you know, New York is a constantly changing organism. So I think like, you know, there's a certain period of, of a lot for a lot of New York, New Yorkers, there's a certain period of, of time where, you know, you're, you're sort of in your informative years and you love the way it was. And then you come back and you don't recognize it. But right. I mean, I, I never thought I would leave New York city until my wife got a job and we had to move. But now I, I really like being, you know, uh, in San Francisco or Los Angeles. I like having more space. I like living in a house. Yeah. Uh, I just th now think about how hard life was in New York, like being on a, uh, a super crowded subway or not having my own washer dryer or a dishwasher. Uh, uh and things well, wait like a minute, that. wait a minute. You have, you had a community dishwasher. No, like you just hand wash all your stuff. Oh, hand wash. Wow. Yeah. And, um, 
in like, you know, you know, every week dropping your, you know, going to a laundromat to do your laundry or having like wash and fold or whatever. Yeah, um, it really is your part of this kind of breathing organism that is the city, you know. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. crazy. And so now it's just nice to have like my own space. Like I, we have, I have like a garage where I can like set up all my lights and my camera equipment where when we lived in New York, there was a corner in our apartment that was like a rat's nest of like sea stands <laughs> and lighting equipment. And, totally. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. Well, very cool, man. And well, yeah, so we, we met an acting class and I was compelled to reach out to you and I, everyone check out James Coker.com because there's a section says called things I've made and it's all your short films. Oh, and stuff. James W. Coker. I think James, oh, James, sorry, James. is a, is a photographer. I'm sure he's, <laughs> sure he's great. James, you should check out his stuff too. Maybe he does headshots. James, <laughs> James W. Coker.com. I really, one I really can relate to is one called skate city because oh, yeah. Jim will tell you, um, I have, I'm like an aged disco roller skater. I mean, I wore those skates. They're very hip right now. Do you still have skates? I know, but I had them back in the day. Well, you'd be skating around and dancing around until everyone bites the dust. And then you'd take a break and get a slice of pizza and play Pac-Man and then go back yeah. out there, right? Yeah. And it's almost like it was like this kind of war between the polyurethane disco roller skaters <laughs> and, and the, the inline skaters, the rollerblade teams. Yeah. How That's did that idea first, come around? It's one of the first things I ever made. I was... Um, I. Um, I was in Central Park with my my wife, well, my girlfriend at the time, but now my wife. Uh, and there is a uh, organization called the Central Park Dance Skating Association. No way. And yeah, and every Sunday they they set up like barriers and they have a DJ and there's like you know anywhere between fifty to two hundred people just skating around and dancing. And I was just like, this is so much fun. And so I wanted to sort of write something around that and. Uh, that's how we came up with the idea for Skate City. <laughs> yeah. I really, Jim, dig in on these, man. We're like, you'll, you'll come back to me and you'll be like, oh my God, the guy's a genius. Okay, so now tell us about something that, that I can, I want to steal an acting lesson from you. How can I, how do you get your mug in a national campaign for something like Spectrum Internet? Well, I think a lot of it has to do with building relationships with the directors and casting directors who work on those campaigns because I was auditioning for commercials. I, 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 first booked the spectrum campaign in like August of 2018. But by that point I had been consistently auditioning for, um, commercials in New York for, for like five or six years. Yeah. Um, and I think a lot of it had to do with the fact that even, even when I didn't book a spot, I, there, there were times when I knew I did a good job in the room and that left a lasting impression. And I, I felt like down the road that would, would benefit me somehow. Yeah. Because, because I, you know, I was told after the fact that one of the, one of the reasons why I was in the running in the beginning for, for the spectrum spot is, is, is a casting director that I'd worked with in the past had recommended me to the director. So, um, they were keeping their eyes out for me. And I think, you know, in one way or another had already had a bias painted in their, in their mind that this might be the right person. Yes. If that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, because when I first went in, I, I bombed the audition. Well, well, tell us about auditions because I know that in modern day commercials and most commercials are not, they're not um, informative, some talking head guy, like 98% of commercials now are quirky and ironic and there's a comedic angle. So uh, improv actors are actually, uh, you know, they're favored. Yeah, absolutely. Because I think a lot of the times uh, you'll they'll come in with with copy, um, and Jim, you probably know this because you're a commercial guy, uh, especially doing voiceover and stuff. But like, you'll have like your 15 second spots and your 30 second spots, and it's just filled to the brim with the message from the brand, right? Yes. And you have to find a way to make it entertaining. And I think that's why they like improv um, improvisers specifically, is because they can find a way to sort of um, just put it like a sprinkle of humor in here and there without getting off message. So how much of that final version of the spectrum, the, but the buddy one, the buddy story where it's you and another cat and he's in the foreground and you're in the back on your laptop and you guys have this kind of witty repartee was, was that all written out or, or was that a take where they said, give me a little bit, something different. I think the core of it is written out, but then uh, we'll start we'll start playing around with it and doing alts. And the director uh, is going to 
um, Brennan Gibbons, who's like an unbelievable commercial commercial director who directs all of the progressive spots with flow. Wow. Um, and has like a great comedic mind, especially for, for commercials. Um, he'll, he just knows when something's working and when it doesn't. Uh, so he will be like, you know, all right. Uh, you know, I feel like there's something missing here. Like let's, let's pl- play around with this. And so when he knows that something really isn't, isn't working, he'll, he'll put it out to us and be like, you know, like, uh, what do you think we should do here? And we'll start playing around with it. And, you know, if it makes, if it makes him laugh, it makes the other crew members laugh. It makes the, the client, the agency laugh. We, we know we have something there. Yeah. Um, Cause but there's like, a lot of fish. Uh, there's a lot of chefs in the kitchen there because oh, yeah. you've got the agency, you got the, the brand people, the director, the, yeah, you got to get approval all the way down. So it's got to go through so many different filters before it actually ends up on TV. Um, and, um, yes, but I think the core of it is, is, is already written out because we, we don't, unfortunately don't have a lot of time to play around with it. You know, sure. we, uh, the last round of spectrum spots that we shot, we shot eight spots in three days. Um, and you know, everything has to be perfect in the frame before we can even start shooting. Um, and you know, every, every, the placement of everything is so deliberate. Uh, and so we, we don't have as much time to play around with it as we would like, but typically when we shoot these spots, we'll do a read through the, the day before to sort of get the timing down of everything to make sure like the thirties are actually coming in at like 27 or 28, not coming in mm-hmm. at like 40. Wow. Um, and so, and Look then we'll, post. yeah, yeah so it's, it's tempo pacing dynamics. It's the same language as music. Yeah. You know, it's an old, it's an old thing in radio where, Hey, we got a 30 second, but we've got 45 seconds of copy. So make it fast. <laughs> so you have to, <laughs> you have to delete happened. some and or well, buts. No. Well, you know, basically what I do is I have a lot of dry voiceovers that I give different clients and lately they've come back. Well, we need to fit it in at 26. I'm going, then write 26 second <laughs> copy. Yeah. Well, you need to do it fast. I'm, I can compress this and it still won't work. Yeah. You You're know? like, I'm not the micro machines guy. No, I exactly. Know We're reading like a freaking disclaimer, <laughs> you know? I mean, I just did a Toyota commercial where I'm like, like remaining 2020 Prius hybrids, just 179 a month, 2040 Camry hybrids, so just 189. And it's like, you can't understand what I'm saying. No. <laughs> but hey, we need to get it in at 26 seconds. Did right. you, how did you do it, Jim? What did you do? I had to speed through it. I mean, before it was a nice relaxed read. I was like, you know, just able to really milk out the different uh, nuances of each uh, sentence. Like, you know, 2020 Camry hybrids, now just 189 a month. That kind of thing. Now he's like, 2020 Camry Hybrids now just 189 a month. Remaining 2020 Highlanders just 229. A month. You know that you can't do it. <gasps> oh my <Yeah>. god! <laughs> so you might have to stop yourself and then and then splice them together the files. Oh, wait, disclaimers for me. I always had to do that. Okay. Wow. Yeah, no, no. Well, I, I just feel like I mean, there's a much more ahead of this for you, but the fact that that's got to be a real celebration to get all the boxes checked, get the approval of all those people, get the campaign. Your first check comes. It keeps coming. Uh, I mean, I mean, that's gotta be, do you know Flo and do you know the Toyota girl? The Toyota girl was a, a groundlings girl, I believe. I believe, well, I know, um, the, uh, the actor who plays Flo on the progression spots is a groundling. Yeah. Um, but I, I, I don't know about the actor from the Toyota spots. I think she is a groundling, but I'm not sure. Yeah. So that's the other, you know, you're either like a UCB guy or an IO or you're a yeah. second city or a, um, groundling and they've all got their different versions of, of what comedy is. Right. Yeah. And how to get funny. Yeah. And they're all like very different. Like um, they're all very different, like schools of thought, like groundlings is more character based where like um, you're really learning how to write for yourself and, and write like character monologues um, where UCB's focus or strength is more long form improv. Yeah. Um, and then second city is like, it's a, like a whole nother beast. Uh, IO is improv, but then like second city is like a whole nother beast where it's like, it's very corporate. And like a lot of the shows they do are, you know, the, the bulk of the sketches that they write come from sessions doing improv, ah. but it's very polished. The final product is very polished. Because a lot of times it, it ends up being, there's like a, like, as I've gone to the second city on Hollywood Boulevard and mm-hmm. they have shows that are, there's a band and they're very rehearsed. 
Yeah. I mean, there's a lot going on. So yeah, that, that's just sort of their vibe. I don't think the second city, you know, is the second city LA spot still around? I know I iOS know. closed. It, it may have gone. I think iOS closed, but I mean, I went to the second city just a few years back. Eventually I chose the UCB and I did the, I think I did the six day intensive or five day intensive. Yeah, It was, it was intense. And I'm glad I, I just, I recommend everybody to take an improv class, no matter what you do, because you are walking that tight rope of not yeah. knowing what you are going to do, having to trust yourself and other people around you in a team in front of a live audience. I think it's a good compliment to like anything you do. It's just conditions your brain to think differently, which I think is I think Jim would be great at it. Yeah. Jim, I think yeah. you would Jim, I feel like you would be a great, very naturalistic actor. I would be a bad actor. <laughs> you think so? Yeah, because they would give me the script and I would go, I I, I just don't talk like this. You know? <laughs> like this is this this script has got the word regularly in it, and I never use that word because it's the bane of my existence. Regularly. regularly. Yeah, it's, that's a tough I one. I hate that word. Like, you know. Even on 30 Rock, what was the big word that they always had problems saying, the name of the show? That was uh, Jane Kazmarzik's character. She was on a show called The Rural Juror. Oh, The Rural Juror. Yeah, of course. <laughs> the what? <laughs> that was so fun. The Rural like, Juror. Like regularly. <laughs> what words yeah. are the bane of your existence that you see it in a script and you're like, ah, fuck. The words liberal arts is always very hard for me to say. I always liberal stumble arts. on liberal arts. <laughs> I just had a conversation this morning about the word um, uh, comfortable. And I'm going, you mean comfortable? No, comfortable. No, it's comfortable. That's the way to properly <laughs> say it. Comfortable, no, comfortable. No, it's not comfortable. It's I don't do the A. Oh, excuse me, Jim. I didn't pronounce, Com pronounce the A. Comfortable. Comfortable. <laughs> and just That's like this can is made out of aluminum. Are, are aluminum. you a what is with that lately? Are you a lately LaCroix? The freaking word, you know, height. <laughs> like what height is it? What the hell? What are you saying height for? Where does height come from? Oh, you're a bubbly guy. I'm a well. I'm a I'm a Lacroix guy as well. I mean, I pound those things. It's yes, like crack because it's like you know you need to get your water in, but this makes it interesting. Plus, it yep. mixes really well with vodka. It does. <laughs> back to these words. I know you know understanding drinks are really interesting and everything, but words. I mean, <laughs> words. Come on. Where did we go here? We just brushed me off. Jim does not want to talk about sour seltzer right soda. now. <laughs> God, Jim. You know, I, I've, got, I've got this paint sample over here. Want to talk about it? Let's see. Let me find something. Yeah, what is it? Eggshell? <laughs> it's gray. There's, There's so like many versions of white at the paint store. <laughs> I wasn't like, serious. Let's not talk about this. There's virgin white. There's eggshell white. There's... Hey, you know, what do you guys think of this tape dispenser? I mean, it's... Uh, Stop. Can improv this. How can hey, no, I used to have the... I used to have a percussion improv group. It was me and Colby Calais' drummer, and we would go, and we'd go to Zany's Comedy Hit Club. This. And we would like, strike we, but we would, yeah, it was called strike that, but we would put limitations on ourselves. We would say, okay, tonight we're only going to play office supplies or tonight we're only going to play uh, kitchen utensils. And we would put yeah. some restrictions on ourselves and it was so fun. I love that. That's the like, audience uh, didn't know what the hell was happening. It's but like it, office space meets stomp. Uh, exactly. <laughs> James W. Coker. The Rich Redmond Show will be right back. Those who are self-employed, especially musicians, think homeownership is unattainable. For Bruce Klein, it took seven years to purchase his first home as a self-employed working musician. But once he did, man, was it satisfying. So he decided he wanted to help other musicians and creatives gain that same satisfaction. Bruce earned his lending license and is now helping people avoid the mistakes he made on his seven-year journey. If you're a self-employed musician, he can help. Go to MusiciansMortgage.com, powered by Movement Mortgage. Bruce Klein, NMLS, number 1465948. Movement Mortgage supports equal housing opportunity. NMLS, number 39179. NMLS, ConsumerAccess.org. Henry Ford once said that if you need a machine and don't buy it, then you will ultimately find that you have paid for it and don't have it. Nothing could be truer about energy-efficient LED lighting in your business. At Big Dot Lighting, we can show you how a portion of your savings from a commercial LED lighting upgrade will be paid for in hardly any time at all. Until then, you're paying for them anyway. Book a no-cost lighting energy assessment with Big Dot Lighting. At least 30% of your utility bill is waiting to be saved. Go to BigDotLighting.com. 
Are you a drummer looking to expand your drumming vocabulary or take your career to the next level? You can connect with me for one-on-one -on -one virtual lessons and consultations that are now 30% off. I cover topics like styles, reading music, the Nashville number system, charting, music business 101, and career guidance. Simply send me an email at booking at richredmond.com to schedule. And for more information on all of my products and services, visit richredmond.com. This is the Rich Redman Show. James, what was the lead actress's name in Kimmy Schmidt that you got to almost Ellie Kemper. kiss? Yeah, yeah, Ellie Kemper from The Office. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then how fast was that scene shot? Do you remember the episode in the season you were in? It was the pilot of the show. The pilot of the show. The first yeah. episode. First episode. Yeah. Nice. Um, it was pretty quick. I mean, um, it, it took a little longer because it was a club scene and they're like 150 background to sort of place and everything. Yeah. And um, however, um, once they started shooting, it was, you know, probably two or three hours and then we were done. Um, Ellie Kemper, by the way, is one of the nicest people in the world. Um, she's, a, she's, she's a cutie, man. She's, she's so, so nice. I, yeah. There was a, a few years I after, a few years after... <laughs> A few years after I shot that uh, that pilot, I was an extra in like uh, a, like a credit card commercial for like Chase or something, and I'm like sitting in a movie theater with like a hundred other people, and she was in it. Yeah. And she walked in to shoot, and then she like turned and looked at the crowd, and then she saw me, and she was like, "Oh, hi, James." And I'm like, "What? That you didn't have to. You didn't have to do that." That's nice. Yeah, yeah. she remembers people and names and places and faces. Yeah, she's great. She also knew my brother really well because my brother um, did craft service and catering on on the show for uh, a number of years. Nice. Um, but yeah, one of the nicest people in the world. No. Wow. No. That's how Alan Thick was when I met him. Oh yeah. Yeah, he came in and did a commercial when I worked in Vegas, and uh, he was actually uh, of all the people that came in to do the commercial, the least. Um, particular the other yeah. no names were like prima donnas but he was really? like whatever let's just get the use the radio microphones we'll just get this done it's because he's he sitting came, pretty he's got that growing pains money he's got that animal miracles money <laughs> he, he came back he's like hey jim i'm like wow you actually remember my name that's cool thanks oh right on what's <clears throat> what's your comedic uh, vision for your your your, co your career vision for yourself buddy because you're still such a young man like, do you want to land the multicam or a single cam? So, so I love multicam comedies. Um, what I, the dream for me was to be on an ensemble comedy like The Office, like 30 Rock, like Veep, uh, Parks sure. and Rec. However, there aren't really a lot of shows like that anymore. Um, and maybe, you know, the industry and the tastes will, will change over the years. Um, but like, for me, like that was always a dream, but now because sort of the landscape of film and TV is changing so much and broad comedy doesn't seem to have the same appeal as it once did, hmm. at, le at least to the people who make the decisions, yeah. I, I sort of need to reevaluate and figure out what it is I want because what I did want doesn't <laughs> that's interesting more. that you're saying that the and a lot of those are are single cam so you yeah. know when you guys watch modern family for you guys out there and you got that kind of like shaky camera style yeah that's what Hand they would help. consider single cam where if sure. you watch like two broke girls or the king of queens that's a multi-cam on a set in yeah. front of a live studio audience which is my favorite of course probably because i'm ancient but but it's like you say the tastes are changing at least with the the decision makers but that those are the ones that are syndicated and are keeping us company through sure. covid yeah 100% the broadest of comedies i feel like i feel like though and i could be wrong i feel like uh, a lot of networks don't let sh shows uh find their voice anymore like it either needs to be a hit right away or it's gone like Isn't you know like, the music business too same as the music is, business yeah is it yeah yeah but like cuz like you know there's a show like like Mulaney had uh, John Mulaney had a multicam sitcom that could have been good, but it got canceled after the first season. Uh, like Seinfeld apparently didn't do well uh, in the ratings after its first season. I think it wow. took a while for it to find its audience and become the cult classic that it was. But I, I feel like um, a lot of a lot of networks and streaming services just don't let that happen anymore. Yeah, interesting. I just think if you want to get on the next big thing, whatever it may be, and do your own thing. 
pay attention to what they put out in the 40s and 50s. Now, when then back then it wasn't TV, it was more radio shows, but kind of figure out the nuances which, which resonated in those times and you'll have your next big show. You know, I joke that technology is cyclical, but in this case, you might be right. Well, I'm not even talking about technology. I'm talking about the attitude Friends. and, you know, just the nature of whatever shows were popular back in those times. I think well, that kind of thing will come around. I think you're right because a lot of narrative um, podcasts have started to pick up a lot of speed. There's a show recently that's coming out called uh, Easy Mark, I believe, with Paul Rudd and Will Ferrell that yeah. was originally a narrative podcast that people loved and they're turning it into a TV show. That's crazy. Now, aren't you on one right now with John Cena? Oh, that's, um, that, yeah, that was um, a narrative podcast called 64th Man. And I did like a few really small parts on it. Um, but yeah, it's it super funny. So when you say narrative, it's basically like a, the shadow knows, like radio show. Exactly. Scripted. Yeah. Yeah. All right, see, beat it. The dicks are coming. <laughs> Speaking of the shadow, yeah. I was I was Alec Baldwin's PA for a whole uh, for a season on Thirty Rock, and one time for Christmas, I gave him a shadow T-shirt, and he <laughs> pulled it out and he said, "Why are you giving me this?" Yeah. Oh, that's like, never what like, you want to hear when I you give like, a gift. I was like, did he, did I don't know. I thought you... his lips when he did. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I was like, Why I don't know. I thought you. He's like, I don't know. I thought you find it funny. And he goes, all right, thanks. And he threw it in the corner. Oh, um, no, 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 no. Then he, then he like told me some stories about like shooting the show uh, or shooting the movie and everything. But uh, he was, he was a great guy to work for. He was actually, um, he's very generous and loyal to the people that work for him. Um, like there was one Christmas where I was talking to his hair and makeup people. And I told them I was, you know, they're like, what are you doing for Christmas? I'm like, Oh, well, I, I kind of want to fly home to Dallas, but I'm probably gonna stay here because flights are really expensive. He, they mentioned it to him and he bought me a flight home. So Come I on. see my parents. Like he, uh, I, I used to have like one of those Nokia brick phones that was like falling apart and being held by together by duct tape. Yeah. He bought me my first iPhone. <laughs> like, Oh, that's uh, cool. Like when my dad passed away nine years ago, I was no longer working with him, but he found out and like wrote me a card saying, I'm so sorry to hear about your father. That's so cool. like, um, wow. you know, he gets yeah, a bad you rap. Kinda like you text buddies with him and everything. No, no, no not <laughs> like that. Uh, he, you know, he gets a bad rap, but I, I, I think deep down he's like a really good person. And he's just very, very good to the people who work for him. I love hearing, I love hearing those stories. Well, what about Tina Fey? Oh, she's amazing. <laughs> cool. yeah. She's amazing. Like work, being on that show, um, especially like the first two years I was, I was working on the show was like, I, I went to work every day in awe. Like I yeah. didn't care that I was making no money. I didn't care that I was working crazy hours. I was just so Sounds excited. Like radio. Yeah. Mm. I was just so excited to be there. Um, yeah. and, and, and Tita Faye was one of those people where, um, I don't know how she got through that time being, uh, on that show because, you know, she created the show. She was in the writer's room. She's wearing so many hats as a producer. She's the star of it. And at, at the same time, she was also, um, having to run over to SNL to play Sarah Palin. Cause that's when that was, was happening. Oh my um, God. And um, at least it's all right at 30 rock. Does 30 rock shoot at 30 rock? No. So 30 rock shot at silver cup studios, which is a sound stage in long Island city in Queens, ah. which was an old bread factory that was uh, turned into sound stages. It was like these two brothers, the Suna brothers, uh, Harry and Stu Suna inherited the spread factory from their dad and decided to turn it into sound stages in the Soprano shot there, sex, sex in the City shot there, Gossip Girl, 30 Rock. Um, Is it still going? Yeah, still a, a bunch of people. Yeah, it's always full. A lot of, a lot of shows shoot little, there. Um, you know, every now and then it gets a little yeasty. <laughs> yeah. but, 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 you can but, smell a little moldy and musty. <laughs> at times. But, but I... But, I don't know how Tina Fey got through those years because like she must have been working crazy hours and like, you know, using so much, not just physical, but mental bandwidth to do yeah. everything she was doing. Um, and she um, was always like the nicest person to everyone on set. But I think at the same time was also very guarded because she had to be because yeah. she just had so much going on. And at the same time, she had like a, like a four or five year old daughter. And wow. so it's just, um, I can't imagine, you know, that everyone talks about how that's the dream, but you know, it's like, be careful what, what you wish for, because it must've been very, very hard. Oh, yeah. I want to say that almost the short lived, um, 
comedies and such have, you know, their cultures are much different. You know, you have a culture working on 30 Rock, and I would imagine it was a fun, nurturing, encouraging, positive culture. You know? 100%. Yeah, and that's, what do they go, eight, nine seasons with it or something? It went and seven. Seven seasons. Yeah. Because we just watched it. My kids were really into it. Yeah. yeah. I think yeah. a lot of times the the nature of the content that you're shooting will set the tone for, for the set. Because yeah. I also worked on, like, uh, I also was, like, a PI in Law and Order Criminal Intent and Law and Order SVU. And that was, mm-hmm. like, a much different vibe. Is it more somber and serious? Yeah, and it's also just because, uh, you know, there was originally Law and Order, which they referred to as the mothership, and then there were these yeah. spinoff shows. Bum, they bum. were like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> they were like these well-oiled machines. And so um, everybody knew their job, but I think also the nature of the show, everyone was just there to do their job, where b- because of the nature of, of, of the subject matter on 30 Rock, it was a, a little more lighter. relaxed, a little lighter. Yeah. Uh, you try to crack a joke on Law and Order, and they're all like... <laughs> You're blowing my vibe. <laughs> Good one, Jim. Don't ever do that. Do you have Jim. a soundboard? He's got some samples over there. What is that? Are you, are you working with a stream deck? What is that? It's a Roadcaster Pro. It's a Roadcaster Pro. That it's like 500 is. bucks. It's got built-in sounds. <clears throat> and you can oh, load in that. your own sounds. Oh, I love no, that. I have, I have like six banks of random sound effects. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Don't Kelsey, give that to an Kelsey, improviser, man. Kelsey Grammer falling off of a stage. Oh my God, I love that one. Oh dear you know God. That? <laughs> <laughs> That's a great, great sound effect. I, it's a, like whenever, whenever I'm doing my own podcast lately, I've been doing this bit where uh, if the people talk about how they've met their husbands or girlfriends, yeah. I'm like, so sure. how did that go? And they're like, oh, we met at a, you know, I was delivering T-shirts, and I said, was it kind of like this? Hey, <laughs> I see you there delivering T-shirts. Is it uh, polyester? Or <laughs> cotton? Or is it polycotton blend? <laughs> polycotton blend. So, you know, another thing that, that Jim, yeah, I got to cut you off. He'll just like literally Barry White it all the way through the rest <laughs> of the show. But when I see a lot of your videos on Instagram, everybody check out, what's the Instagram handle? Is it just your name? At this James Coker. James Coker. And this, this so, James Coker, not that James Coker. This James, yeah, this actor, James Coker, not the photographer. And <laughs> so you put it like some really cool bits on there where you've got like human lips on a dog. Oh so yeah. You, what, what, what do you, what do you do for your video editing? Is it like an app you're using or what are you doing there? It's a mix of things. Like, so if you, um, have either use uh, iMovie, <laughs> I, ha- I have in the past. Yeah. So it, it depends on the nature of the, uh, of, of the video. Sometimes I'll edit on splice, which is a, a really nice, easy to use editing tool for your iPhone. Nice. Sometimes I'll use Adobe premiere pro. I used to use iMovie. Um, but also if you, if you have TikTok, are you guys have TikTok? Yeah. Tim's a TikToker. There's unbelievable sure. stuff that you can do in the app. Um, and so, uh, sometimes I'll like use the effects in TikTok, then download it to my phone and then edit it. Um, because editing can be a little tricky in within the app, yeah. but, uh, are you doing TikTok? Are you on it? So doing I, stuff? I started doing it like a few months ago just, uh, yeah. for fun. And I actually prefer it to any other social media app because it's the only time where my content breaks outside of the circle of people I know. Right. It's the only but time I mean, that I see myself hit a cold audience and I get nice. a genuine reaction of whether it's good or not. Well, it's funny because, I mean, you, you can grow an amazing, a tremendous audience on it. We actually had a, Call a me TikToker Chris. on. Call yeah. me Chris. Remember how many she had, how many followers she had at the time, Rich? She had 4.2 million. Unbelievable. At the time, she had she had a just under three. Okay. So how much she now have she's now? She's got 14.8 million followers. Amazing. What? Yeah. How many, how many viewers does an average television show have? Uh, I, I, I'd say like seven to 10 million. I don't know. Seven to 10 million. She's, she's got, got more, eight, more. Yeah. Yeah. And it's funny. Cause there's a, there's a woman on here that I follow. Uh, her name is, hold on a minute. She actually does acting lessons hmm. and she's an actress herself. Of course now it's taking forever to pull up. Oh yeah. And then uh, she encourages people to do a scene with her. Yeah. She does, uh, the, a duet, uh, the yeah. acting challenge, uh, Eleni again. Eliana again. That's her name. Huh. And she just does that. She does acting challenges. She does a scene and you respond and very that's great. great. I 3. think 3. We'll, 3 million followers. She has. That's amazing. I think what yeah. we're seeing, and I, and I wish I had been more of an early adopter 
um, I'm very late to the game on, on TikTok. Uh, but I think what we're seeing on TikTok is sort of a microcosm of what we're going to see in TV and entertainment in the future. I think it's going to be more niche audiences because that's what TikTok really sort of um, focuses on. Like you, if the majority of the people that do well on TikTok have like one niche that they sort of focus on, they do it really well and people keep coming back for that. Um, and, um, I think we're going to see that just broadly in entertainment, uh, as like the years go by, I think we're, instead of like having big, broad comedies, uh, there's a, there's a used to be guy named Chris Gethard who sort of predicted this a few years ago, instead of seeing big, broad comedies, you're going to have people that have a niche following. That's like a little smaller, but they're very dedicated. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, because TV still does carry the same weight that it did back in the 50s and you know, 60s and even through to today. Um, like if you and, it, and, the, and the reason why I say this is because a friend of mine sells what they call OTT uh, advertising um, technology and it's called mm -hmm. over the top. Yeah. So if you're a local car dealer and you want to put your ads in streaming services, essentially that's how they integrate. It's called OTT. Yeah. And a lot of people, from a perception standpoint, when they see and they're streaming stuff, uh, they see a business being advertised on streaming, it really does carry a different weight still. Yeah. Uh, my kids will hear my voice on a TV commercial, even though they've heard me thousands of times on the radio, and go, oh my gosh, dad, we heard you on TV. Yeah, the boob <laughs> tube. There's something very um, and magical about being on the boob tube. I mean, But I'm wondering if it's just another way to get to, you know, discovering talent out there to get them to inevitably and eventually to television. Yeah, yeah no, that's a good, that's a, um, good point. I, th I, you know, I think TV will still be there the same way uh, books and films are still there, but they, it's just yeah. like the, uh, it's, the audience is more um, uh, specialized or like when you, when you go see a movie now, you're going to see something like very special as opposed to going to a movie every, every week. But look at how that is shifting right now. Like sure. movie, movie theaters are going to be in trouble here in the next oh, couple yeah. of years. Um, they are really pivoting. Have you seen what's been happening, Rich? And, and well, well you know, we had a couple of guests on that were talking about the, you know, the Austin Draft House or whatever it is, where it's, where it's like, is that the name of it? Where you can Alamo. go and get it. Alamo, Alamo Draft House. You know, where it's a special, you know, you have your adult beverages and the chairs are super, super comfortable. And then their other thing is, is where you can do things like this might be on the horizon where you pay 75 bucks and you get a bunch of cocktails and two large pizzas delivered to your house and you watch the thing in the comfort of your home. Mm -hmm. A brand new movie. That's what they're doing with Wonder Woman. But it's already yeah. tw tw there, like there's a lot of things on Spectrum in Los Angeles. That when I go to like new releases, okay, great, twenty bucks. Yeah. Well, I mean, if, but if you're going to watch, and I'm surprised that Disney Plus hasn't done this yet because I mean they're so far behind with Black Widow. You know, mm -hmm. they could just easily put that out. They can make a crap ton of money. Are they, they waiting to put it out? They did. They did that with Mulan know. though. In order to see Mulan right away, you had to pay like an extra 30 bucks or something like that. Wow, okay. Because I mean, yeah. with Wonder Woman 1984, uh, HBO, I want to say, is releasing it uh, Christmas Day. What do you mean so, Wonder Woman 1984? It's the next Mon Wonder Woman installment. It's called 1984? Wonder Woman yeah, 1984? You, wow. Yeah, you had to see the previous uh, 1,982 to really understand what's going on though. Otherwise, oh, yeah. it's everything's out of context. <laughs> but the, funny, the other aspect of it is now movie theaters. My daughter did this last Saturday. They're renting out the theaters for a hundred bucks, and you can go watch a movie. And it's a you know like uh, tomorrow we're or Friday rather we're going to see uh, National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation with us and maybe four or five other families. And then we have yeah. the theater to ourselves. We get popcorn. It's a hundred bucks. And you guys are just going to be yelling shitters full at the top mm, of your lungs. Shitter. Oh my, the best. <laughs> Touch it. We're going to see a Christmas story next Tuesday. Awesome. hundred bucks. I mean, Love what that. a testament to both of those films that, that they just, they're just part of our, you know, our family fun that we have at the holidays every year and it never gets old. Oh, a hundred percent. Yeah. Oh, oh here's yeah. the heart. You know, it's yeah. like <laughs> you guys need to go back and watch the story of Elf. It's on uh, the movies that made us. I watched it's, it, uh, Jimmy. Be so proud of me. Yeah. I enjoyed the hell out of it because I'm a Favreau fan. How did you yeah. not like Favreau? I know. Come on. But, I mean, how that and amazing how that movie started out. It came out of nowhere. Yeah. And didn't didn't uh, it was originally developed for Farley, Chris Farley? Yeah. And then, and then yep. Will Ferrell said in an interview, he was a no first, name at the time. Yeah, the first, Will Ferrell said the first two weeks of shooting, he thought the movie was going to be awful because it yeah. was all like exteriors in New York and all like the establishing shots. And he's just like, "What? What am I doing?" And they were yeah. guerrilla style. And then yeah. Old School came out, and people loved Old School. And then people were like, "Oh my God, there's the guy from Old Old School yeah, in the tights." Tank. 
Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. Totally. And it's funny and what, what are the things? What, are, what, was, what were the three, um, the three Amigos. goals Favreau wanted to hit? Do you remember what the first oh, one um, He wanted it to be a timeless family classic. He wanted well, it to feel like one. Rankin Bass. Mm -hmm. And I forgot the other one. Well, that's the, that's the thing is that the last one, they wanted it to make it a, a timeless cl Christmas classic. You, that's hard to do. Yeah. And he's done it. Yeah, he pulled it off. Yeah. He yeah, really did. go-to movie every season. <laughs> totally. Yeah. So what's, uh, what's the future for you, man? What's your five-year plan? Where do you see things going? You know, what are you excited um, about? Well, yeah, Spectrum essentially is on a year by year um, like contract. So I will find out in January if they pick us up for a third year. So fingers crossed that we get to continue to keep doing those because CJ Vanna, who's the other guy in it, uh, we we really love doing those spots. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I think for me, it's I'm I'm just trying to continue to like study at Leslie Khan and and become like a sharper actor when it comes to just like you know receiving a scene and doing a quick scene analysis, script analysis and sort of figuring out the technical aspects of it while making it feel sort of organic and real. Um, I, f five years from now, I just would love to, you know, be auditioning or, you know, be cast in, in like a big ensemble comedy. Hopefully yeah. like those sort of come back. There was a, there was a script last year that I, I auditioned for. It was a NBC pilot called American auto, which is from the, it's from the guy who created uh, superstore, which I absolutely loved. I love the script so much. Um, so, you know, maybe something like that, but I, I, I really love making like these dumb little videos that I, you know, put on Instagram and TikTok and whatnot. It's just like, I feel and you guys being creative, like, I feel like you guys can attest to this, that like, we all, we are our habits, our habits and our routines define us as a person. So you can say all you want that, like, you want to be a musician or you want to be an actor or you want to be a comedian. But if you're not start finding a way to integrate that in your everyday life, like you're doing yourself like an incredible disservice, right? Sure. Yeah. But is it, isn't, uh, I think one of the first steps is to just call yourself that thing. Sure. Yeah. You know? You, I mean, you are a comedian, you are an actor, you know, you, and, and every day you create something funny or entertaining. Yeah. I am and a I, billionaire. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? It doesn't always work. Dang. No. <laughs> but, uh, but for me, I mean, I just like, uh, I'd love to continue to start keep making like, for me, my first love is sketch comedy. All I ever wanted to do was like write for Saturday Night Live. But I understand that like that is a very sort of narrow focus to have. And it's also a very hard job to get. Yeah. So and, and like, while there is some sketch comedy on TV, there isn't a lot. And so there aren't a ton of opportunities to make money making sketch comedy. However, I love it so much. I want to continue to keep doing it, even if it's just like a 40 second thing that I spend a couple hours doing and I send out into the world. I love um, it, man. For me, it's like, it's one of the few things that have kept me sane during this pandemic, you know, be, because I think also it's not that precious. I, I don't know what it's like when you decide to sit down at a drum set and play, but like it's, it's ephemeral, right? It's like, it's like this thing I'm going to do, I'm going to be in the moment, I'm going to do it. And then I'm gonna like, put it out into the world and then it's gone, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But at the same time, it's being recorded and it exists forever. Sure. Sure. But sure. so did you study this year with, I, I studied, um, I studied from April to August without a break on Leslie's zoom classes. Are you still doing her zoom classes? Yeah. Still going strong. I took August off cause my wife and I moved from San Francisco to LA. Yeah. Um, but other than that, I've been doing it pretty consistently. Um, it was intense. I worked really hard. I feel like I got something out of it. A lot of us were thinking, Zoom, is this going to work? But you're staring at the light like it's a camera. You're trying to connect with the other person. There's some valuable skills. No, absolutely. Sure. I think it, it took me a month or so to get used to being like sort of uh, accustomed to to acting on Zoom and being on a class on Zoom. But like your interview with uh, Taylor Nichols, was it? Yeah, he teaches, yeah, uh, it teaches acting at UCLA. Yeah. And like he was talking about in your, in your episode, how like at first he wasn't, he didn't think it would translate to Zoom, but now he, it makes so much sense because you're doing it as if you're auditioning for the camera, as opposed to auditioning for someone in the, in, in the room. Um, 
And so I think it, it makes a lot of sense. I just, I think all of us sort of miss the uh, community aspect of being in the same room with one another. Yeah. Um, Leslie's school is so great. You take your shoes off and you got your snack for the break. And, right. you know, I, 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 th- I think we, you and I were in the same class, but I don't think we ever got grouped into the same group. We were together. in the same group. We were in the same class of like 30 people. And then we got split off. And we got split off. So you, of like, so you never got to see me fall on my face. But the beautiful thing about it is I think, I think God bless her, Leslie, uh, respects me enough to say like here's this guy in his midlife and he's trying something a new skill set and just jumping into the deep end of the pool and i just do it man it's because you don't need to do it you're you're a successful musician in your own right yeah like you you just you're you're just doing it it because you love it i I do love it but at the same time i'm in the game i got my sad card i have reps i I do want to work you know i do want to find it's got to obviously be the right thing for me you know yeah i have my sad card to the floor. <laughs> what a nut. See, I think James is coming out of this with a brand new respect for you, Jim. Thank you. And he respects gotta, me because of the company I keep. I got to get that soundboard. Um, <laughs> so how did you meet your wife? <laughs> well, if you must put it to that music, we met in high school. Oh, yeah. She's I was her hate. teacher. No, I'm just, uh, we were uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I asked you one time, I said, man, I'm, I'm always away from my girlfriend. You know, I said, I have a bike so relationship with my girlfriend. And you're like, well, I'm with my wife all the time. Like all the time is what well, you told we, me. We were together all the time. Well, yeah. when we were in San Francisco, we were spending a lot of time apart because I was coming down to LA for oh, weeks right. at a time. And that was, that was hard. But uh, I, the silver lining for this pandemic is we were able to move to LA and see where we both want to be. Um, but, uh, and we're able to have a, you know, a little more space in a house where we can be in separate parts and not see each other during the course of the day. Where um, are you? Silver Blake, Echo Park? Silver Blake. <laughs> silver Blake. Blake. My North Hollywood. Blake. I love silver. How are you? Where the uh, heck are you? Art or something? Or? <laughs> uh, we're in Atwater Village. Oh, yeah, nice. In, uh, Which, Winter? what? I don't know. I'm just saying random California cities. I, <laughs> which, I which uh, fun fact, a block away from where I live in Atwater Village is G Sun Studios, where the Beastie Boys recorded Check Your Head. Wow. wow. Yeah. Did you, have you visited it? Uh, I mean, you can't go inside it anymore. I think, it, it, I, I think it's just the building now. It's like, it's something else now. It's like a John Varvato store now. Yeah, exactly. It's like CBG <laughs> becoming <laughs> Donald Trump. Uh, but, um, they um and it was their office like their uh, whatever their record label was that was like a subsidiary of was it Capital or whatever the larger or Def Jam or whatever whatever larger record label they were the, their um, subsidiary label was like that was their office to like t- two thousand six, um, but yeah we love it here and yeah we're, man we're we're super happy and just, I've always had a love affair with Los Angeles and yeah. and, and oh god yeah I'll be back. Uh, Second week of January this year, I'm going to be teaching at the Musicians Institute in Hollywood. And even though I'll be in the same city that the school is in, it's all online, baby. Really? Yeah. Spe- speaking of teaching music, uh, this is a great time to plug our sponsor, School of Rock. Do you love rocks? Do you want to <laughs> learn more about rocks? Loving learn, rocks. Learn, learn to become a licensed geologist in just five hours at School of Rock because the earth is like an onion. It has layers. Schoolofrock.com. Right. School of Rock, big dot. <laughs> Jim, Jim what, t- tell James about our idea for a gratitude rock and see if he likes it. It's uh, basically a smooth rock that you would hold in your pocket that reminds you to be uh, have gratitude. Every, Every time you, yeah, you just rub yeah. it and you say something you're grateful for. We're I gonna think there's... We're going to sell these little rocks for uh, $45 each. You know? I love it. <laughs> yeah. We'll be very grateful if people buy them. I think it'd be a lower price point, but yeah, I think we could, I think it would crush it, man. $44. I haven't put it out yet. The gratitude rock, because I thought it's essentially a weapon, you know what I mean? But then I had he a, finds out all the reasons not to do it. It's like you could, somebody could, you could poke an eye out kid, you know, with yeah. your gratitude rock, but all you have to have is a little disclaimer on the package. Hey, you're golden. Remember the disclaimer you sign when you buy a car that if you kill somebody with the car that you won't hold the manufacturer liable. Is that part of the paperwork? No. Oh, gotcha. Yeah. It's pretty much yeah. assumed. Gotcha. Oh, really? Is that what they just assume when you buy the rock? Yeah. Yeah. If you go we're, not, we're, we're not responsible. With, that's kind of you. <laughs> if you put this thing in a sling and kill a giant with it, we are not liable. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Even if his name's Goliath, okay? <laughs> what I mean, Rich, uh, like, sorry, go ahead, Jim. No, you go ahead. You no, I was like, really. Rich, like, what, like, what's this 
pandemic been like for you because you spend so much time on the road and you're you're used to like constantly be like being in sessions like playing with other people and collaborating like what like what's this adjustment been like for you it's been it's been it's been uh, interesting i've never been able to spend nine pretty much nine months straight in los angeles and it was very good for my relationship with my gal because we went from seeing each other twice a month to seeing each other 24 hours a day seven days a week for nine months yeah. and a lot a lot of couples have not done well but we have we had a, we've had a great time um I studied with Leslie. I wrote a TEDx talk that's pretty much kind of ready to go. I'm always trying to develop something, working on another book. Yeah, I get the sticks in my hands every day. And then, of course, I took probably, I don't know, 14 flights back and forth, to, you know, because they still do recording set and little mask sessions. I'm with my buddies. We're on the floor. We're making records and we've got the mask on, you know. But yeah. then I come back, to the, come back to the sun. But I think 2001 is going to be another transition slash pivot year for everyone. And we're just oh, yeah? Have- did, you, did you invent time travel to go back in time to 2001? 2001? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry. 2021. Oh, God. So, uh, James, I just am so impressed with you, man. You're such a likable guy. So talented. Everyone check out jameswcoker.com. And on Instagram, where all the kids are, it's this James Coker. What are we doing here? Oh, I'm I'm, I'm practically signing off. But this is Jim's favorite part of the show. My part, favorite part of the show, it's the random question of the day. It's the random question, random question, random question of the day. All right, James. How much are you worth? No, I'm joking. <laughs> what was fun to do once, but you'll never do it again? Oh, God. That's, um, that's a good question. I don't know. We can pass and go to another one if you want. I can. Uh, I, I, yeah, I don't know. Can I pass? Hold on. Oh, that's a bad one. That's the, that's oh. the redneck version of 60 Minutes. It's 30... 30 minutes. All right, yeah. All right. What personality trait do you value most and which do you dislike the most? Oh, jeez. Personality trait do I like the most? Remember, your wife is listening. <laughs> the, the personality trait about myself or about other people? Uh, I don't know. Just about yourself. Personality trait I appreciate the most is is my ability to find common br- ground with almost anyone. But That's my awesome. the one that I I hate the most is like I hold a terrible grudge. Like there are people that slighted me when I was seven years old that I will never forgive, and I occasionally look up online to see how they're doing. Wow! Wow! There's a guy who bullied me in high school. Um, He's on your list. He was on my list, and I'm like, you know, one day if I decide to go post, I'm coming after him. And then I looked him up, and he's a brain surgeon. And I'm like, I can't oh. be mad at you anymore. <laughs> he's a brain surgeon. Well, you're, hey, you're like, yeah, you're a brain surgeon, but I'm on a every spectrum commercial. Suck it. <laughs> I'm like, this guy's saving lives. I got to take him off the list. <laughs> That's nice. That really <laughs> is nice. Hey, we got to say hi to Harry. Hi, Harry. He's on his, he's on his jog. Shout out to Harry. That's right. At two in the morning, our friend Harry, he's a drummer. He's a YouTuber. He's a content creator. He's got over 100,000 subscribers. So, like, it, he's he doing something right. Listens. Yeah, we keep yeah. him company on his jogs. So we told him we'd give him shout outs. Pretty, oh, pretty, pretty amazing. Any parting thoughts, James? Uh, no. Um, no. I would, thanks so much for having me. This was a blast. You guys are super fun, and I would love to come back. Uh, yeah. If you guys ever, if someone booked, uh, cancels last minute. Well, yeah. we'll, come up, we'll come up with that improv game. We'll figure that out. Yeah. We'll figure out the improv game, but man, no, just uh, just a delightful personality, tons of talent, and I hope to like in real time do some acting with you at some point in Los Angeles. Yeah, It'll be great. That'd be a blast. Yeah, really, really good. Fun. I, I, can I ask you one more question? Have you of been? Course. Have, you, have you auditioned for a lot of like uh, musical parts? Like, uh, like I know, like Daisy Jones and the Six was like assembling like a whole band when they were casting that show. Um. I really want to, and this was, this came up within this mastermind group. I have this networking group of, you know, business owners and we try to help each other move the ball further down the field. And they're like, what's your biggest challenge? And for me, I do so many creative things yeah. that my schedule is my enemy because like usually in a normal touring year, this is a luxury actually in the music business, I'll get my whole tour as a PDF. And then I have all these little spaces that I can fill things in. But when I go to do audition for a commercial, I might audition on a Monday. They might like me. I come back for the callback, but then I can't actually do the shoot. Yeah. Yeah. So scheduling mm-hmm. nightmare, but, uh, 
I think 2021, I'm going to be mostly based in Los Angeles and I'm going to audition my ass off. That's awesome. Yeah, man. Yeah, that's great. So we'll have to get together when it's safe. We'll get some iced coffee. Jim, thank you so much for your time and talent. This would never happen without you, buddy. And to all the right. listeners out there, thank you guys so much. Send us an email, Show at gmail.com. And as always, do us a favor. Subscribe, share, rate, review, tell a friend. Keep coming back for the good stuff. We'll be here. Thanks so much. James, appreciate it, man. Thanks, y'all. See y'all. This has been The Rich Redmond Show. Subscribe, rate, and follow along at richredmond.com.